Hi, I'm Brian Mullen, and this is Force the Line. Now, one year ago today, there was no doubt in my mind that this is a model of the world in which we live. Little did I know that a month later, I would stumble onto Flat Earth Theory, which sounds ridiculous when you first hear it. Flat Earth, the whole idea is, you know, you're going to fall off the edge. You know, we were taught in school that the silly ancients believed that the Earth was flat and that Columbus sailed to America and basically proved that it was a ball. I mean, that's what I was taught as a kid. And so I started seeing these Flat Earth videos popping up constantly on YouTube and started seeing some chat about it on the internet and I just started thinking to myself, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, I was, I was always a huge nerd when I was a kid. I watched all the Star Treks, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, all that stuff. Loved Star Wars. Played a ton of video games. Star Wars X-Wing is still one of my all-time favorite video games. And so I, you know, the idea that there's no, that, that, that we're not a spinning ball in space, you know, kind of really threw me off. There's no planets out there. It's not what we think it is. You know, I'm just like, this is ridiculous. I'm going to prove this wrong. So I set out to do so. One of the things that caught my attention about Flat Earth Theory was that we can see things much farther away than we should be able to if the surface of the Earth is curved, if based on a curvature or a circumference of 25,000 miles. So, first thing I did, I got some binoculars, I drove over to Cape Canaveral, because I live very close there, just to bring some irony into it as well, and I started to lay down on the beach and look at things that were six, seven miles away to the north. I looked at the port of uh, the port of Canaveral, at the beach that juts out a little bit from the, uh, the, the the beach south of it, and I could see it. I could see the waves washing up on it, and based on a sphere with a circumference of 25,000 miles, that shouldn't be possible. I found the flat Earth community. A man named Michael Conkey came up with this chart. Very good chart. So this is a great contribution to the world, in my opinion, to, to get an idea of how much drop there should be from level view. Okay. To to help you visualize what this is saying is, if you draw, if you were to draw an AutoCAD or any other drafting software, MicroStation or anything else a circle with a radius of 3,959 miles and then draw a line tangent to that circle at every mile from that tangent point you should see so much drop. Now that tangent line is assuming that your view is level. When you look out over a surface of water your view is level. I think it's level. Right? People argue that when you're looking at things in the distance, you're actually looking down and that this isn't right. But I think my view's level. When I'm standing here upright and looking out, I think my view is pretty much level. And I see things across a body of water. I don't think I'm looking down at them. But the real proof for me came when I went to Lake Apopka in Florida, the second largest lake in Florida. There are areas of the lake where there's an eight mile stretch across. I took my telescope out there and I set it, I actually put the tripod in the water and I set the, the telescope about three feet above the surface of the water and I could see the shore on the other side. And that doesn't make any sense because when you look at the curvature chart, if you can see that at eight miles, there should be roughly a 42 foot drop, right? Almost 43 feet. Now, subtracting the height of my telescope, because it's above the water, take about three feet, roughly there should be a 40 foot, a little under a 40 foot drop to the shore on the other side. But I can see it. I shouldn't be able to see it. There should be a curve of water in the way. This was the biggest problem I found. And then I started observing the sky. I had taken astronomy a few years ago, and I'd always questioned, you know, I'd, I'd walk out of astronomy, you know, I took it in the fall, and 
I'd walk out after class after discussing galaxies and nebulas and all these things, and I'd just look at the sky and just like, where is this stuff? Of course, back then I just thought I needed a more, tel more powerful telescope or access to the Hubble, which I have questions of whether that thing even exists now, but I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't prove it wrong. I couldn't prove flat Earth theory wrong. I thought it would be so easy to do, and I, it was, it was actually very difficult to do. And I became so obsessed with this that I actually started my own series on YouTube called Balls Out Physics. And the whole purpose of the series was to put the ball model to the test, to really throw the questions out there, and to get some feedback from people. I made some errors in my videos, and I have to go back and correct those errors. In the words of the great John F. Kennedy, an error does not become a mistake until we refuse to correct it. So I will correct some of those errors. However, I don't think that anything I've done in my videos is absolutely wrong. I just need to fix some things. But anyway, my last video was released at the end of September. I released it at the end of September. And then I did a radio interview on Flat Earth and other hot potatoes. And I was going to keep going with my series, but then, well, I had a wrench thrown in my gears. A very wise retired surveyor of 32 years contacted me at work. He saw my videos and figured out where I worked and gave me a call. And we discussed an experiment that, we, that he deemed the plumbicular experiment about using lasers and... Uh, came up with a way that we could actually try to measure the curvature to prove this. And then shortly after that, he sent me a link to the Rectilineator documentary, which is actually the backbone of concave Earth theory. Concave Earth basically is the, is the theory that we do live in a sphere in a sphere, we're on the inside of the sphere, and that the Earth curves up away from us, and we just can't see the curve because of an optical illusion. I looked into this some too. And right now, I'm not going to say that the Earth is a convex sphere, which is this model, that the Earth is flat, or that the Earth is concave. At the moment, I really don't know. The only thing I do know is that I can see things farther away that I should be able to. And observing the celestial bodies with my telescope, and watching the sun and the moon, I'm having a really tough time believing that they're that far away. You know, the sun and the moon move through the same path in the sky. Without being told that the sun is 93 million miles away, and that we are rotating, and that's what makes it go through our sky, you could never conclude that. That's why the ancients thought that the Earth is flat, and that, that we live in a geocentric world, meaning that everything revolves around us. Okay? Something to keep in mind. A Major League Baseball player steps up to the plate. Pitcher throws the ball, 90 mile per hour fastball. That batter can see that ball so well that he can hit it with his bat. And then, an outfielder can tell from the sound and the sight of that ball that it's going to go over his head. So he starts running backwards. He runs backwards fast enough to jump up against the wall in the outfield and make a game-winning catch. He saw that ball leave the bat and was able to catch it. This happens all the time. Just go watch some baseball games or go watch some montage videos of amazing MLB catches on, on YouTube. Those same two players observing the moon and the sun would not be able to conclude that one is going around us and we are going around the other just from observing them. They have to be told so. People say our eyes trick us. We can't trust our eyes. NASA says this. Uh, I mean, all three theories, the flat earth, uh, convex sphere, and concave sphere, are all saying that we are seeing illusions or it's our perception or there's vanishing points. Basically, we can't trust our eyes. But baseball players can hit baseballs. My high school physics teacher actually used to say that one of the most amazing things about this world was that an outfielder can judge where a ball is going to go and catch it. 
I like to think I had the greatest physics teacher ever. Some of the people that went to high school with me might agree, because he was a great teacher. Maybe we're a little biased, but he was awesome. So anyway, I saw the rectilineator documentary, and the experiment is very good. It seems good. It was done in the late 1800s in Naples Beach, Florida. I posted a link down below in the description. You can watch it. And so, I started thinking about this. How, how can we do this easier? Because the experiment requires a lot of beach and it requires the surface of water. Because the theory is that the surface of water must follow the shape of the earth. Whether it's flat, concave, or convex, water has to, con water has to contour to it. You know? if, we, if these pictures from space are real, which we don't really have any pictures for space, another thing I should throw in there, you can look this up, all of the images we have from space are actually composites. NASA admits to this, it's no big secret that they, they piece these things together, which is very surprising. Why can't we just get a picture and a video of it? I, I, I don't know. Uh, but, um, if, unless you want to believe that the, that the uh, 1990 Galileo footage is real, even though the clouds remain stationary for a, a full 360 degree spin. I mean, that can't be possible, but, uh, I mean, that's 24 hours. But anyway, everybody's arguing over this. Uh, well, not everybody, but the flat earth community, concave community, yeah, I, got, I got really into this, and I also got really turned off by it, because people are starting to fight with each other over this. Human beings are fighting over their world, their home. I, I got kind of turned off by the Flat Earth community because there's a Facebook group called Spherical vs. Flat Earth and you know people come in who believe that they live in a, on a spinning ball and they start asking questions and they're suddenly bombarded by memes and comments that are, are just off the wall kind of disrespecting the people that are asking these questions and I'm just thinking to myself you know you th you flat earthers, you used to think you lived on a spinning ball too. Why are you attacking these people? You know, why why do human beings why are we so quick to jump on a side and fight with each other? I've never really understood that. You know, Democrats, Republicans, Giants, Cowboys, East, West, this this just always happens. You know, why we we don't really get anywhere when we fight with each other over things. We just end up with two sides an endless debate. It just goes on and on and on. We never really get anywhere. We need to start working together, I think. So, anyway, our eyes cannot be trusted. That's the general consensus. We're being deceived. We cannot trust our own eyes. So, we really can't conclude that the Earth is flat, concave, or convex from cameras or telescopes or anything, right? Because everybody's just going to argue, oh, it's an illusion, light's bending, oh, this, that, this is what's happening, you're not seeing what you're really seeing, blah, blah, blah. So, why don't we just measure it? I started thinking about the rectilinear experiment, I started thinking of easier ways to do it. Uh, existing structures like bridge piers we could use to, to try to, to build a rectilinear type, type device over the surface of water and measure the distance to the water. But the more I, I kept thinking about it, and I'm a structural engineer, so I do a lot with erecting structures and, and how much it costs and blah, blah, blah. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't come up with a cheap way to do this. And then, for some reason, about a week ago, I was tying my shoes, getting ready for work, and it hit me. We don't need water. There's actually a very easy way to do this. And... That's what I'm going to call force the line, or the force the line experiment. No offense to the rectilineator, but in this day and age, that's not really a good name. People are going to make fun of the rectilineator for obvious reasons. So this is force the line. Here's my idea. What we do is we need two miles of relatively flat land, or it's easier if we use flat land. I'm thinking Oklahoma, Nebraska, uh, Florida would work, but there's a lot of crap in the way in Florida. There's so much foliage here that we would need maybe power. We could do this under power lines, but who really wants to work under power lines? Um, so here's what we do. 
we set posts over a two mile stretch of land. What I've got here are my posts, okay? 10 feet on center. Here's your first post, second post at 10 feet, third post at 20 feet, all the way down to two miles, mile, two miles away. Here's your last post at 10,560 feet or two miles, and your second to last post at 10,550 feet, okay? I've got my break line in here to show that the distance between these two posts is 10,530 feet. You see what, what, what I've drawn here, okay? Now the idea is everything is based off the very off the first two posts. Okay? What we do, we set the posts in a straight line. Very very easy to do. Contractors can definitely do this. And then between the very first two posts, we construct a beam between the two and level that beam. Okay? We level this beam, okay, make it level. This is typically how beams are constructed. You always level them out, unless there's a roof slope or something. But for a floor beam or something, you would always level it. Anyway, so this point right here is this point on the Earth if we live on a convex sphere, okay? Meaning that when this beam is leveled, there is a li an imaginary line perpendicular to the center of gravity of the Earth, extending this is to the center of the Earth. And then we do the same thing all the way to the end. We level each one of these beams all the way for two miles. Okay? So, every time you level one of these beams, it should be extending, it should be perpendicular to a line extending to the center of the gravity of the Earth. So, over two miles, those beams will actually follow the curve. They have to. If, if, a, if, this, if a level works, the only way it can really work is on a sphere is if it works with the center of gravity, okay? Then, what we do is we use a rectilinear type device below it to force the line. This very first beam we construct right here is perfectly parallel, or as close as we can get to perfectly parallel to this beam. It's leveled too. We level that beam, okay? But then for all of the rest of the beams on the forced line, as, as I'm calling it, we use a connection here that forces this beam, it forces a right angle connection to the first beam, okay? So, say this is our first beam that's leveled, okay? It's leveled out. The next beam that comes in, we use precision machine work, or like a CNC machine, or something similar, to create a connection that forces a right angle connection to that first beam. Okay? So now, this second beam is not actually level. You wouldn't be able to tell from the naked eye, and if you put a level on it, it would probably still show that it's level because our levels are not that accurate. But, it will, stay, it will stay in line with this beam. And we do that all the way down to the end. Now, we can just use a rectilinear type of vise. We don't have to build these beams. We don't need 1,057 of these beams on the bottom because they're going to be expensive to make, to make a right angle connection like this. You see I've got 90 degrees at all four corners. We can just leapfrog it and just mark it. Mark the columns or the posts as we go until we get the line. Now if the Earth is a sphere with a circumference of 25,000 miles, then over two miles we should see from this point to this point a drop of roughly 32 inches. You can draw this in AutoCAD and prove it. This is what it has to be if the circumference of our world is 32 inches or, or 25,000 miles. Okay, so we go all the way down to the end, and this last post, we should have 32 inches between these two lines, okay? Because over here we started at 64 to give ourselves ample space, and at the end, there should be 32 inches from, roughly. It's not going to be exact, you know, there, there'll be some error, but there's enough 
there's so much drop that is that any any small errors and plumb plumbness of the of these columns and everything shouldn't affect it too much. This could be 30 inches, whatever. Now in the rectilinear experiment, they showed that the Earth curved up roughly 30 inches. That the concave sphere it has the same circumference as the convex sphere. Now that experiment was done 118 years ago, and nobody's done anything else like this since then. In fact, I kind of I find it funny that we don't have anything like this in the world. We have nothing that shows our curvature. Imagine how cool it would be to, to build something like this and leave it in place. Oklahoma, Nebraska, you guys you guys want some, some tourism? Build this. Okay? Imagine driving in a dark sky area at night, and maybe they put some low lights, some lights that run down the line on this thing, and drive next to it, put a path next to it, or ride a bike or something. And as you're traveling, you can watch the curvature happen right before your eyes. You can watch these two lines converge. They will both appear to be lines to you, but one of them's actually a line and the other one's curving. Why don't we have this? Disney, I'm looking at you. Now you might argue, oh, it's just, you know, nobody's going to spend money on that. It's, a, it's just a waste of money to do something like that. We have pictures from space that show it's a ball. There's no point. Well, those pictures from space cannot calculate this curvature. They cannot prove the curvature. And on top of that, a few years ago, the United States federal government spent $800,000 on studying the benefits of snail sex. Seriously. Now, I'm all for studying our world, but I'm more interested, as a tax-paying citizen, in the curvature of my world than I am in snail sex. Snails, you know, I go, I ride my bike a lot, I'm out in the woods a lot, I see snails every now and then. They look like they're doing okay. I don't think we need to study their sexual habits. Well, we can study their sexual habits after we are proven that we live on this ball. I want to see this. I want this to happen so that I can rest easier at night and know that I'm not being lied to. So, let's force the line. I did. I, I ran some rough numbers, and if we assume that all these members are 10 feet long, forgetting the rectilinear, just the 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 top line and the posts, let's assume they're all 10 feet long and that they all weigh, they're all structural steel, and they weigh 10 pounds per foot. Now since this is outdoors, we're going to want to hot dip, hot dip galvanize all of these shapes. Hot dip galvanized structural steel runs about 3,000 fed notes per ton, a ton being 2,000 pounds. So, adding all that up, we need 1,056 plus 1 posts, so 1,057 posts, and 1,056 beams, you get around $317,000. That's a lot less than what we spent on studying snail sex. And we could do this cheaper too if we put some serious engineering work into it. They don't need the structural steel members weighing 10 pounds per foot. That's very conservative. We could make it better than that. But I'm just throwing some numbers out there. And then we also have to build this rectilinear type device which, then, then you could throw another hundred grand in there for that thing, because it's going to take some very precision machining to build it. But we can do it. And, but who I'm really looking at is, is, what about Disney? You guys have all that land south of Orlando. You've got Epcot Center that sh with, the, with the Epcot ball that shows us it's a small world after all. Show us how small it is. Why don't we have this? Why don't we have this? I don't know. Let's force the line. Let's stop arguing about what we're seeing and measure it mechanically. Let's find our curvature or no curvature. You know, to be able to drive next to this and look up at the universe and shake your fist and say, hey, we're not so small after all. That's only 32 inches and two miles. What? We ain't that small, right? Are we gonna see this? If we do this? I think this experiment would work thought about this a lot. I don't think there's any real flaw in this. Please tell me if you see a flaw in it. But I think that this simple tool that we've been using for a very long time 
can show us the truth. Just a level. That's all we need, really. And of course, some precision machining to make the rectilinear type device. But simplicity is what's important. A simple way to measure the curvature. And we can construct these things all over the world. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is now telling us that we, we're not a perfect sphere as it appears from space, appears from space, that we are an oblate spheroid, or more like a pear shape. Well, let's figure out how much of a pear we are. If we build these things across flat surfaces of land, I mean, you could do this in the mountains, you would just need really long poles, but if we built this all over the world, built these things all over the world and got our numbers and started comparing it and, and really kept building them over and over so we get really good at building them to, and improving the accuracy of the measurements, we could really get an idea of what our world is, of how much it curves, so we could model it better. You know, globes, probably, if it's an oblate spheroid, as we're told, wouldn't be a perfect sphere like this. They would actually, we'd actually be able to show where it's not a perfect sphere because we've measured it, we've done it, if this is it. Now, if the Earth is actually flat, then starting at 64 inches here, you would end with 64 inches here. There would be no drop, it would stay the same. If the Earth is concave, then you would actually end up with 64 inches plus 32 inches, the blue line would be up here somewhere because it would show a curve up. Very simple. Let's do it. These governments around the world are just um, taking money from us and, and, and doing all kinds of things. You know, Whether that money that was used to study snail sex really went to study snail sex, I have my doubts. Who knows? I work in the public sector and I've seen enormous amounts of embezzlements and wastes of money and it's just incredible to me. So, let's spend the money on something that would prove to us the world we live in, and I think this would actually bring humanity together pretty well. Every country could show off our curve. You know, curves so much in China, it curves this much here. How cool would that be? Disney, build this. Peace.